Hey, I'm Pat. In this video, I will be showing you how to get the player instance inside of any Roblox script inside Studio. This is uh, indeed the video that any Roblox scripting you has always wanted. Uh, I got all the answers for you. So if you press play, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you kind of like the most important thing because Roblox Studio is pretty complicated as a multiplayer game, so it's a little bit more than just you can get the player in any script with one line code. It's not really that simple. But if we go ahead and look, when we press play, we can see that our player instance is added underneath players, and it is our player's name. So unless we have the player's name that we want to get, we can't get it uh, very easily just by indexing players usually, unless we're in a local script, which I'll go over in a little bit. But as you can see, our player is here, and we can access it underneath players. So the easiest way would just to be going to a local script and say our player is equal to players that local player. We just get the player service, so it's just game that players the same as game that players that local player. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it so when we click this button we get uh, a coin leader stat. So I'm gonna also need to get leader stats. Alright we're going to set up some leader steps. So, uh, we this is the pretty much really the only way that you should really get a local player inside of a local script because a local script will always belong to a specific player. So, local player will just get the player that that script belongs to, right? On a server script, the server scripts belong to the server, so they're not assigned to a specific player. So we can't do local player in the server, because it just doesn't make any sense, right? Since there's no local player that's local to the server. So instead, what we do is we rely on events to give us our player instance. So depending on what we're doing with a server script, we're going to use our event to get the player. So in this case, when a player joins the game, we're going to want to make leader stats and set it up for players. So we can tell when a player joins the game with the player added event from the player service. And we just connect that to our function. And then we take the first parameter, which will always be the player, as it tells you right here, right? And now we got our player pretty easily. And I'm just going to add a simple leader stats, leader stats script for coins. Nothing complicated, just a normal leader stats script. Now in our local script, we're going to go ahead. This is our local script for our button, which is just a GUI button or a text button inside of a screen GUI. I literally didn't even name anything. Like It's just like the most basic stuff. right? So now what we can do is we can access our player instance. Right, so our player instance is where we are storing the leader stats because <clears throat> we parent it to the player instance on the server here. And then we parent the coins to our leader stats folder, which is under the player. So, what we can do is we can do player, uh, player dot leader stats dot coins dot value, which will give us the coins. Uh, the in value coins its value property and we'll just increase it by one. So now if we go ahead and play, uh, you can see we have our leader stats and if we go underneath our player instance inside players, we can see there's the leader stats folder that we created in the server script and then there's the coins, right? So now if we go ahead and press one here, you can see it increases our coins value and also increases our uh, leader stat value property over here. But if we go ahead and look on the server, uh, which we can't even see the leader stats here, but if we go and look on our player through the server, you can see that the value is zero. And this is because we're editing the leader stats with a local script, which will never work. Uh, it won't, no other player will be able to see it, the server won't be able to see it. And the main reason for that is to prevent exploiting because exploiters can create their own local scripts basically and can do anything that a local script can do. So instead what we're going to want to do is set up a remote event. So I'm just going to go ahead and make a remote uh, folder here called remotes inside of replicated storage. And we'll name this remote event uh, give coin. So every time this remote is fired, we will give the player a coin. So this will move on to our next play to get a player inside of a server script. 
which would be using a uh, remote event. So what we'll do is we'll get uh, replicated storage. And then we're gonna need to reference our remote event that we just made, replicated storage.remotes, uh, give coin, and we'll listen to the on server event and we'll connect to our function. And you can see it tells us the first parameter here is going to be the player. And then after that is any, because you can pass uh, different information to three remote events. So on the server, the first parameter will always be the player. And then after that, it'll be in order of the variables that you pass to the server or the arguments that you pass to the server. So in this case, we're just gonna be using the player. And now we got our player inside of this event here. So now every time that this event is fired, it will give us the player that triggered this event. And we can use that player to do things like modify their leader stats. So now what we can do is we can actually just copy this code from here and just paste it in here since we're doing basically the same thing. But now in here, what we need to do is fire our remote event instead of adding coins. So now what we'll do is we'll reference the same remote event, uh, give coin, and we will do, I don't know why I keep doing it, fire server, which will uh, tell the server that we want to, or tell you know, the studio or Roblox, hey, we wanna uh, communicate with the server, fire to the server, and that will trigger this event on the server. And since it's connected to this function, it'll run the code inside this function, which will just give the player one coin. So now if we go ahead and test it, press play. Now if I click, you know, you can see I still get coins. But now if I go up here, click and change over to the server and look at our player, you can see that the coins replicated to the server. So now the server can also see how many coins we have, so can other players in the game. So uh, that's a few ways to get the player. But now say uh, I have this uh, spinning coin here, uh, this coin that spins here, and I want it so whenever the player touches it, the coin gets destroyed and they also gain a leader stat. Now this gets a little bit more complicated because uh, in this case, what we're gonna need to do is use the touched event. Now. What you might think is, oh, I can just use a local script. And yeah, you could actually use a local script in this case, but I'm going to show you how to do it a different way. But one thing to keep in mind is local scripts will not work inside a workspace. They won't run inside a workspace because the workspace does not belong to a specific player. So it won't know which script or which device to run the script on because workspace is not specific to a player. Unlike GUI, which each player gets their own copy of a GUI. So if we wanted to do this through a local script, what we could do instead is we could do workspace that coins that coin that touched, and then we can uh, connect function, and then we can just uh, replicated storage that remotes that give coin fire server, and we can just do it like this, like super easy through a a local script uh, which works just fine and I believe doing it on the server is actually no different uh, but I will go ahead and handle this on the server just to show you how to get a player through with just the character because that's how it will work here so what I'll do is add another script here this is just a free model clone with some free model scripts in it but I'm gonna make my own script for collision just for demonstration uh, So what we'll do is we'll do script.parent, which will be the coin that touched, which will listen to when the coin is touched, and we'll connect that to our function. And what you'll notice is that it does not give us the player. Instead, what it says is it gives us other part, base part. And what other part is, is the part that collided with our part to trigger this function. So the script.parent, wherever our script that parent touches another part it will trigger this function and it will give us the other part that the script that parent touched right so in this case we want to check to see if it's a player that was touched and if it is then we'll give them some money right so 
A uh, very typical name for the parameter here would be hit. So we're just going to use hit. And now the easiest way for us to get the character through this would be to do uh, equals hit or char, which in this case would be the character would be hit dot parent. But a more reliable way, because uh, hit dot parent, actually I'll go ahead and play the game just to show you a um, more visual representation. So you can see whenever we play the game, we have our own character inside a workspace. And inside of our character are all these parts. So if one of these parts collides with this coin, it will trigger that event and it will pass the part that collided. So if our uh, left foot touches this coin, it will trigger the event and pass it to left foot, right? So in order for us to get the character, we just do uh, hit dot parent, which would be left up left foot dot parent would be our character model, which is actually just a model. It's just a group of parts. So an easier way and more reliable way would be to do uh, hit find first ancestor ancestor being like the parent that parent that parent or whatever so it'll just search for a parent which is a model so it'll just search for a parent of the hit part which is a model and the reason for this is because when a player has an accessory inside the accessory is a part and if that accessory hits something, then the parent of that part of the accessory will be the accessory instead of the character, if that makes any sense. So you'll have to do parent two times. Instead, this just compensates for like both of that. So you don't have to worry about that. It's pretty reliable. Now what we'll do is we'll check if character. And the reason for this is because if we hit another part, then obviously we're going to want to make sure that it is actually a player and not just like some random part inside a workspace. So we'll check to make sure that we found a model uh, ancestor, right? Now what we'll also need to do is check to see if there's a humanoid. So, or what we could do, actually no, yeah. Local hum, which will be our humanoid equals char find first child, which is a humanoid. You can also just do find first child but which is a is a lot better because it doesn't rely on the name of the part. It just relies on what kind of instance it is. And now what we'll do is if we do have a humanoid, that will tell us that it is a character because all characters have a humanoid. So that's how we can tell if it's a character or not. So now we're getting to the part where we actually get the player, which in that case, we're going to need player service. Now what we can do is do players dot get our players get I think it's a method yeah get player from character and then you can see it says character model it tells us the data or the type it is which is a model so we're going to pass it our character and that will give us our player inside of our touched event now what we can do is we can just copy this over from this script all right and then what we can do is script that parent destroy since uh, we picked up the coins and now we just got to get rid of it after we already gave us some uh, money right so now if I go ahead and touch the coin you can see it gives us some money and it deletes the coin uh, not too complicated it's a little different uh, not every event is going to give you the player and in this case it wouldn't make sense for it to give you the player because you might need to use this for touching other parts you might use this in different ways so it wouldn't really make sense all right, so now the next two ways are pretty simple. Uh, I'm just gonna show you with the click detector. So we have like this sword dingy. Uh, and what I'll do is I added a click detector inside this part, which is kind of bigger than everything. So whenever you hover over it, it'll always show as the click detector. Script out parent. That click detector will reference our click detector and listen on mouse click connected to our function and this is pretty easy this will actually just give us the player and it even tells us here player who clicked so it'll give us the player that clicked the click detector that triggered it and it will be pretty easy to do this uh, what I'm going to do instead in this case is give us a sword because that's a little bit more uh, interesting than just giving us coins 
So what I'll do is I'll reference the sword uh, game. This is going to get messy because uh, I don't feel like making variables anymore. <laughs> so we'll reference our sword, which is replicate storage that tools. This is just the, the basic Roblox sword. Uh, you can see I have this sword and I just put it inside of a folder inside of a storage, whatever. So whenever we do that, we'll make a new sword by cloning that sword. Now what we'll do is we'll parent the new sword to the player's backpack by doing player dot backpack. All right, pretty simple. So whenever we click on it, we can easily get the player through the event, and then we can just clone a sword and parent it to the backpack. Uh, I think I forgot to anchor the part. I'm uh, kind of a noob, guys. I'm kind of stupid, not gonna lie. All right, so I anchored the part, and now when I go ahead and click on it, uh, you can see it's a little buggy, but every time I click on it, Oh god, that fucking destroyed my ears. Every time I click on it, it gives me a sword. Because we do player.backpack, which is where all the player's tools are stored. So we got a sword, and it works perfectly fine. One thing to take note is that if you are cloning a tool, you'll always want to do it on the server. Because if you do it in a local script, and the tool has server scripts inside of it, the server script isn't going to work because it was cloned on the client. So one last thing I'll show you, which actually isn't much different than a click detector, it's just a proximity prompt. So I'm actually gonna copy over the script from the other one, and we'll just change the words, proximity prompt and triggered. So proximity prompt is literally the same thing. Like it passes you to player just the same, player who triggered in this case, and we'll just have the exact same script where we copy a sword and put it in the player's backpack. So now if I go ahead and spawn in, E to interact, every time I interact, it gives me a sword. All right, cool. Uh, yeah. So it's really not that hard to get a player. It just depends on what exactly you are doing uh, in the that situation on the server. On the local, on the client, it's obviously pretty easy, just players that local player, but in the server, it's going to be very dependent on what exactly you are doing. Hopefully this video helped you in case you were a uh, confused noob scripter. Uh, now you're a uh, pro god, ultimate god, goofy goober scripter, yes. All right, uh, anyways, uh, I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching, bye.